It was the freshest, coolest, purest water we had ever tasted. And it was just ours. When I was a kid, my um, family bought land in Montana. And when I say they bought land in Montana, I mean my parents bought land in the middle of Podunk nowhere. <laughs> like the middle, middle of nowhere, there's nothing to be seen for miles and miles and miles but sagebrush, cheat grass, knapweed, and rocks. <laughs> and then the occasional pine tree, you know, middle, middle of nowhere. It's this dry, kind of arid place. My parents are probably like, they wouldn't say so, but I would say so as the one who lived there too. Uh, it's a dry, arid place. And so my parents bought land here, and they had, this, they had this dream, this desire to build their home. It was their dream home. And I don't know if you know this, but if you want to live somewhere, if you, if you want to live in a house, you need water. <laughs> you need water. And, the, and there's, no, there's no city water lines going up to this place in the middle of Podunk nowhere. And so they had to dig a well. And so for reference, we, you know, we talked to all of our neighbors around us, which a neighbor in that area is like, they're a half a mile away. They're a mile away. Like, it's spread out. And we asked them, like, how much water are you guys getting out of your wells? And they would tell us, like, half a gallon a minute three quarters of a gallon a minute and then like that's not a lot like that that's enough to you know run your shower at a really low pressure <laughs> and then but don't run the you can't run the laundry at the same time you know what I'm saying like it's not a lot and so we kind of knew what we were getting into so we're like all right well hopefully you know when we dig our well it will we'll get we'll be able to get water and so my dad called in all these experts, and he's, they, they're like, you know, they're professionals, and they tell you, okay, you should drill here, you should drill here, you should drill here. And he called three, and they all said different things, you know. It's like, yeah, you should drill here. Oh, yeah, up the hill. Oh, no, at the bottom of the hill, where this green clump of sagebrush is. You know, there was a guy with a crystal. We're not proud of it. Um, <laughs> You know, he's like feeling for, I don't think it's spiritual. I think they're feeling for vibrations. <laughs> anyway, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, um, so they all tell us different things. And then my dad's like, well, I don't even know what to do. Like, should we dig here? Should we dig there? Should we dig all the way over there? And then so my dad turns to the Lord and he prays. There we go. There it is. That, that redeems the crystal, right? Um, and so they're walking around. He's walking around, and he just, like, he's praying, God, show me where I should dig. And he feels like God says there. Dig there. It's different from all the other places. It's different, you know? <laughs> it's like, we're going to do it right here. And so um, maybe a couple weeks later, he calls in the digging crew, the, the well drilling crew, and drill, drill, drilling a well is expensive. It's like $40 a foot. I think it's like $60 now a foot to drill it down. And so he brings in this crew, he has them, says, dig there. They're like, okay, the experts said dig over there, but whatever, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's your well. And so this hand represents the drill bit, this hand represents our bank account, and they're both going to go down. And so, <laughs> and so we start drilling <laughs> this thing, it goes 100 feet, nothing. <laughs> okay, let's keep going, keep going. 200 feet. Nothing. Okay, let's, let's keep going. 300 feet. Nothing. Like zilch, nothing. Like there's, no, there's no half gallon of water. There's no trickle. It's nothing. It's dry bones, right? <laughs> like nothing. And so at this point, my dad is stressed. He's like, oh man, should I cut my losses? Is this, should, did we, should we sell the property and they can use it as like a dump or something? Like there's no water here. There, we can't build a house here. But he prays to God again and he feels like, let's just dig a little bit deeper. And so we're 300 feet in the ground. <laughs> All right. Like we're approaching the center of the earth at this point. You know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're drilling deep, and he goes, Zzz. and then at 350 feet, like a miracle, <laughs> this huge, gushing fountain of water just explodes, erupts out of the ground. So much water. It was under so much pressure. Just went, boom, 
flooded the whole area. It was amazing. And listen here, 35 gallons a minute. 35 gallons a minute. Remember our neighbors, they had half a gallon a minute. You can't run the washer and the, and the, and the, the dishwasher and the shower at the same time. 35, that's 70 times the amount of water of everyone else. And when you got that seven in there, you know it's Jesus, right? 70, 70 times what all of our neighbors had. It was absolutely amazing. 35 gallons per minute of the freshest, coolest, purest water we had ever tasted. It was refreshing. It wasn't full of sulfur. Have you ever tasted water that had sulfur in it? Nasty. <laughs> Nasty. Didn't have sulfur in it. Didn't have mud in it. It was surrounded by like a granite shell. So it was pure. It just tasted so good. I've never tasted water as good as, as, good as that ever since. It was pure. It was crisp. It quenched our thirst. Whenever we were satisfied, we could go back to the well and be quenched by that well. So it was refreshing, but it was also reserved. That well was just ours. That well was ours, only ours. We did not have to share it with anyone else. Our neighbors would come, well, we only have half a gallon. Too bad, that's ours. <laughs> it's under our property. We didn't have to share it with anyone. And we did not have to go to anybody else to get water. We were fine. We were refreshed, and it was reserved for only us. It was a huge blessing, 35 gallons a minute. It was more than enough. And I have some pictures. I have some pictures for you that I wanted to share. This is the front of our house. So this is the house in the middle of the desert. As you can see, we, you know, we, my dad's lawn was immaculate. They grew trees. It was beautiful. My dad set up a whole underground sprinkler system. He even built a pond. Next picture. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> he built an artificial pond, not like a frog pond. Like, this is the pond where he trained his Labradors on how to retrieve. Like, so, so he, like, pumped that thing full of water every day. It was just, it was, it was too much. It was so much. It was more than enough. It was an incredible blessing. And here's a satellite picture from space. You see it? See the, see, just see the desert all around it. And then there's just this bright, big, bright green patch. Look at our neighbor's house. They have a sand lawn. <laughs> and then, then we have our house. It's just green, green, green. Such a blessing. 35 gallons a minute. It was more than enough. It was refreshing, and it was reserved. And it was a huge blessing. So today, as Pastor Garen warned you, we're talking about sex. And... Specifically, we're going to be talking about sex within the covenant of marriage and how God designed sex to be both refreshing and reserved. Refreshing, it quenches our thirst, it satisfies us, and reserved for only you two. Reserved. And if we want to experience this refreshment, this, this great blessing, we need to adopt a mindset of purity. We've been in this sermon series called Essential Mindsets. And it's, it's all about how if we want to live our best life, if we want to have the best life God has for us, if we want to experience life to the fullest, experience ministry to the fullest, like live our best life for God too and, the, and his kingdom, sometimes we need to change the way we think. Sometimes we need to change our mindset. And so today, we're, it's a controversial topic because the, what, what the church believes and what God believes is drastically different from what the world believes and what the world teaches. And God teaches purity. God teaches this, that, that sex should be reserved but also that sex should be refreshing. Sex should be wonderful. It should be something that we continuously come back to as a way to refresh one another. So we're going to be talking more about that today. Um, and I, I just wanted to say, like, this, this is a message for married couples, but it's also a message for those of you who are dating, those of you who are thinking of dating, and those of you who are also living in singleness or feel called to live a, a life of singleness. Like, God has called certain people to live that way. And so this is for everyone. This is for you guys, too. So we look to Proverbs. 
to see, like, where, where is the ideal for marriage? Where is the ideal for sex? And it has a lot to say. And in it, we see that sex and marriage are elevated to the absolute highest level. It is a gift. It is wonderful. And it is good. It's a good thing. It's referred to and it's illustrated to over and over again as a well. As a well. See, what a, what a good illustration. As a fountain, as a source of water that will not run dry, a source of refreshment and blessing that's to be reserved for husbands and wives. So let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Proverbs 5, verse 15 says, Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Let your wife be a fountain. This is, go down to 18. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. And I, I like to switch things around sometimes, so let's look at that from the male perspective too. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your husband. Verse 18, let your husband be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the husband of your youth. He is a loving deer, a strong buck, a stag. Let his arms satisfy and comfort you always. May you always be captivated by his love. You see, God designed sex. God designed marriage to be refreshing. God designed marriage to be something that we delight in, that we find satisfaction in. When we think of like th those images, it, they're comforting. It's refreshing. Arms and breasts. It's like these are designed. To, they were designed to comfort. They were designed to care. They, they, it's, it's a wonderful thing that God has created for men and women to enjoy. And we have that imagery of the well a wellspring, a fountain of water. There's nothing more refreshing than water. Nothing. If you're thirsty, if you're going through the desert and you're just, oh, I'm so thirsty, like I'm dying of thirst, what do you want? A cup of cocoa? A Slurpee? Oh, what about like a smoothie? You want like a smoothie or, like, or dark coffee? You want that? No, you want water. Water is the only thing that quenches us to that deep, like, necessary level water. It nourishes the soul. It nourishes the body. And it brings comfort and satisfaction. So after a long day of work, a long day of toil, a long day of struggle, a long day of dealing with those dang kids, you both, hus husband and wi wife, wives, can come. You go away from the well during the day. Usually that's how it happens. It's your work for home. I don't know. You go away from the well during the day, but at, at the end of the day, you both return to the well to be refreshed. And yes, this means sexual intimacy, but it, 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 and that's what it was designed to be, but also it, it can be non-sexual too. We, we refresh each other through just a warm embrace, through talking about each, each other's day, through listening, for goodness sakes, to each other about each other's day. Um, it could be anything, playing a game, what, watching a movie. Oh my goodness, just vegging out on the couch. What, like, not, you're not even talking to each other, but you're kind of in like the same vicinity as one another, but you're kind of like enjoying each other's company, and your wife is watching The Amazing Race, even though it's really not your favorite show, but you're doing it because you love her. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Anyway, you are there for each other. The point is that husbands and wives are there for each other at the end of the day, through thick and thin, to always be a place of refreshment and revitalization for one another, sexually and non-sexually. You're always available to help cleanse each other from really a very dirty world. The Bible talks about the world, and we don't even have to have the Bible's instruction on it to know and understand that we live in a sexually immoral world. Like, we can't go anywhere without being bombarded by sex. We can't turn on the TV without being bombarded by sex. It is everywhere. And so it's this act of coming back to the well that actually preserves us, 
this act of coming back to the well that actually saves us and keeps us from sexual immorality. And that's what we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. Paul says, because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. Now, later in the passage, he does say some people are called to singleness. And so if that's you, that's great. And that's, Paul actually says that's better because you can dedicate the time you would be spending serving your wife, serving your husband. You can dedicate to the Lord. But for the sake of this message and talking about sex and marriage, we're just going to kind of focus on, on the, the purity aspect. So, because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman should have her own husband. Verse 3, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Now, we don't like that verse. Why not? It's in the Bible. I don't think we as humans uh, like giving authority of ourselves over to anyone. And so sometimes this verse is hard for us because we see it as like, well, I don't want anyone to be in control of my destiny. I don't want anyone to have control over my body, control of my sexuality. Like, you could even say, like, it feels like rape. It feels like, it it feels wrong to, to say you have control over me, you have authority over me, you have power over me. But that's just the wrong mindset. That's the wrong way to look at it. It's not, the word is giving authority. The word is not taking authority. It's giving authority. So the husband gives authority over his body, over his mind, over his soul to his wife. He says, I am yours and you are mine. And the wife does the same. It is, it's it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful unity Back in the, in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, it talks about how when man comes to, comes, is joined with woman in marriage, the two become one flesh. So in one, in one essence of this, of this, two individuals are coming together and they are giving of themselves and becoming one person. So, so the two people become together something greater. But it, it, it has this attitude of, I'm giving it all for you. Everything I have is yours. Everything you have is mine. And I think that's beautiful. Isn't that how we talk to each other? Like, that's how Sarah and I talk to each other. Like, I'm so glad that you're mine. Like, I'd give everything for you. And I feel like that, that's romantic, that's beautiful, and that's what God has intended for men and women to experience within marriage. It's amazing. Nothing is held back within this relationship. It's a relationship of complete openness and honesty. It's pure. Pure, like the freshest, crispest water. It's pure. You are my well, you are my fountain, and I am yours. No one else can have you. You're mine, and I'm yours. And that point is so important, that you are mine and I am yours. Because you can't just think of sex and marriage as a place of refreshment just for you. Sex and marriage is also a place of refreshment for your spouse. So, so many times we can get caught up in these verses and say, well, I'm not feeling really refreshed right now, so that means it's your duty to refresh me. No, that's backwards. That's backwards. We should be approaching this subject from, honey, you're looking like you need to be refreshed. Let me refresh you. So we look to the other person and say, I want to take care of you. If we have reached a point in our marriages where we are demanding refreshment, demanding sex to to care just for us, then we're missing half of the equation. Marriage and sex, it's designed to take care of the other person. You're putting their needs above yours. And yes, this is why communication is so important. You guys, you know you can talk about your sexual needs, right? Right? We're getting a little deeper than I thought than I thought we were going to, but we're going there. <laughs> you can talk about this kind of stuff with each other, and it's okay, and it's good. This is a relationship of complete openness and honesty. You're supposed to know everything about each other, the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
it's, it's, all, it's all part and parcel, and it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful, and that's what God has intended for you. Marriage and sex is a place of refreshment for all of you. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5, says this. Another tough passage. 7, verse 5. So do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself more completely to prayer. Love that. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your, la- your lack of self-control. And this is a really interesting verse um, because once again, Paul is bringing in this idea that the world we're living in is sexually immoral. We are bombarded by temptations everywhere we go. We literally carry around these phones, these portals to pornography in our pocket at all times. It's like sex has never been more available. Temptation has never been more available than it has today. So the world was awful back 2,000 years ago. It's worse now. Like the issues that were there, prostitution, people having affairs, things like that, lust, that was, that's all still here, but we have infinite access to pornography. It, it's so much worse. It's so much more available so that men and women, if they, if, even if they get like an inkling of like, oh man, I'm starting to feel tempted, I think I might sin, it's right there, right at their hip pocket. There's no, like, they, like we're skipping this um, deliberation. Well, should I have the affair? Should I, should I flirt with that other man, that other woman? It's like you, you don't even have to go there. You can just have an impure thought and then go straight to your phone. That's why we're going to talk about that later, how it's so important to set blocks up. It's so important to guard and reserve your marriage for things such as this. It's really important. So Paul says this, from that, says this from that perspective. Because the world is so immortal, don't withhold yourselves from one another. And let's just leave sex out for a second. Don't withhold yourselves from one another. There should never be an instance in our lives and in our marriage where we are withholding ourselves from our spouse. You are united as one flesh. You are designed to be this new creation, this new creature that is wonderful and beautiful and perfect. And one of the reasons that we have sex, one of the reasons we have it between a man and a woman is to prevent sexual immorality. And I have heard from multiple of you in this room, as well as in my life, this is a very common thing where because a man, because a woman have sinned against their spouse, they made a mistake, they messed up, the other spouse will withhold sex from them. And so what happens? Then the other spouse, the spouse, they messed up. No, granted, they did. They screwed up. And so their spouse withholds sex from them. Well, what happens? You now have entered a vicious cycle of, well, now they are not being refreshed in their home. They are not being sexually um, helped at home. And so then they go back out into the world and they're tempted and they fail again and again. And then their spouse gets mad at them and withholds sex again and again. And then you are trapped forever. Let it never be. We have forgiveness. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Like Jesus talks in the New Testament about like, if you even look upon a woman with lust and you've committed adultery with her in your heart, we've all sinned. Like we're all sinners. We've all messed up. Jesus also taught forgiveness. Jesus also taught reconciliation and coming back together and saying, yeah, you messed up, but I forgive you. I look at you and I see you and you are the person that God has brought for me and we're going to make it work. There's forgiveness, there's reconciliation, and then there's trying your dangest to not sin again. Okay? It's not like, okay, she's just going to forgive me, he's just going to forgive me, so I'm just going to keep doing it. We try our darndest to not sin again. Okay? I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you for listening to a 29-year-old talk to you about sex. (laughs) I am blessed. One of the blessings, and Pastor Garrett knows this, one of the blessings of being a preacher is that I don't say anything on my own authority. 
It's all in the Bible. I'm just telling you what Jesus says. And so I can come up here and feel pretty comfortable talking to you about this stuff because, hey, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I'm just telling you what God says. Yeah, so th- thank you for, for coming alongside me in this. I think this is a really important topic, and I'm glad that we can talk about it because purity is so important. It can really improve your life, make your life so great. Yep, let's go on. So be, finally, be the well, be the place of refreshment for your spouse, and through the purity of your union, you can reject the impurities of this world. Keep coming back together sexually and non-sexually, and you can turn to the world and say, I don't need that. I don't need that milkshake. I don't need that Coke. I don't need that hot cocoa. I have fresh, delicious, crisp water at home, and that's the only thing that can really quench me. All right, so number one, God designed sex, God designed marriage to be refreshing. Point two, God also designed sex to be reserved for marriage. God designed sex to be reserved. Proverbs 5, verse 15 again, says, Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets, having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. You see, sex is a special relationship. It's intended to be shared between just two people. It's two people becoming one flesh. You ever had like that special thing where like it was a secret or something that you you shared only with one person and it was special because it was just your thing. That's what sex is like. That's what sex is supposed to be like. It's your special thing that only you two know about, only you two have, and it is wonderful. It is beautiful. Have you ever made a reservation at a restaurant? Raise your hand. I have. It's not often. Normally you can walk in, but whatever. Um, if you've made a, re- a reservation at a restaurant, you're, like, you're planning your date. It's going to be in a week from now. You make the reservation. It's going to be great. It's going to be this awesome experience. You're going to connect with your wife or your husband in a new way. Maybe you haven't had a date in a long time. So this, this is going to be just the two of us. Just the two of us. And so you get to the restaurant. You sit down at the table. Well, first you have to say, I have a reservation. Then they bring you to your table. But you sit down at the table, and it's great. You're enjoying your time together. You're enjoying the food. Wonderful conversation. Talking about your dreams, your, your future, your goals. Think, talking about each other. And then, what would happen if maybe halfway through the dinner, your husband, your wife, your spouse, looks over at the door, and sees there's someone trying to, like, trying to get in. There's someone trying to get in the door. They're like, come on, come on, I'm hungry. I want to get in. Like, please let me in. I, I just, I just want to come and enjoy this too. Please let me in. But they can't because they don't have a reservation. They have, they're not welcome in the restaurant. They're not welcome at the table. But your spouse looks over at them and says, hey, it's okay, buddy. Come on and Come sit at our table. Come join us. There, there's an extra seat here. There's one of those little tube things with the fork and the knife and the other fork and the third fork and then, you know, all that stuff. It's all right here. There's an extra one. Come down. Sit at the table with us. Enjoy. How, you want some pasta? Have some pasta. Yeah, yeah. Here, you scrape it on my plate. Yeah, sure. Great. How would you feel? How would you feel as the other spouse? You're just mumbling. I can't hear you. Not good. That would stink. (laughs) I'd be mad. (laughs) This was supposed to be a date. This was supposed to be a, um, a time where it was just you two. It was supposed to be special, and your spouse invited someone else in. You brought someone in, and you sat them down at their table, at the table. They should have never been there. It was reserved. It was reserved. The relationship that should have been reserved between just you two has now been shared. And that is what culture has done to sex. That is what we, in a lot of ways, have said about sex or treated sex. Culture says sex should be shared. 
with as many people as possible before marriage, after marriage, whether it's real, physical, like having an actual affair or sleeping with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or looking at pornography or I learned about this last week. There's something called having a work wife or a work husband where like you you're not having actually you're you're just going to work and you flirt with the same person every single day and it's like this ongoing relationship you have someone doesn't have to be sexual but you're still um you're breaking a barrier you're having intimacy with somebody who is not your wife who is not your husband that's bringing someone else to the table so culture says Sex should be shared with as many people as possible. But God says when sex is shared, it becomes less special. It becomes less special. And so what's the answer? What do we do knowing this? We need to reserve sex for only our spouse. Before marriage, during marriage. Through the the whole kit and caboodle, we reserve it. We say, this is something that's just for you and me, and it's special, and it's amazing, and I love that God created it that way. This is so cool. What a blessing. I am yours. You are mine only. We don't belong to anybody else. We're not bringing anyone else to the table, real or virtual. We're not bringing anyone else to eat at the table to share our pasta with them. It's gross. I don't like sharing forks. I'd share a knife, though. That has no relevance to anything. I'm just joking. Not, every, not everything is an illustration, but I'll think of it. Anyway, I am yours, you are mine only. I have to get through this somehow, people. I am yours, you are mine only. We don't belong to anybody else. You are all I have, all I need, and that is more than enough. 35 gallons a minute of the, precious, of the freshest, coolest, purest water I've ever tasted. It's all ours. This is a mindset of purity. And I love purity. What does purity mean? Purity can mean it's all one thing. 100% pure virgin olive oil. 100%. It's all one thing. So when we say we want to have a mindset of purity, yes, it means that it's refreshing, it's great, it's awesome, but it's also just one thing. Just you and just me together. So how can we guard this mindset of purity? Whether you are married or you are single, you can all follow this. How can we guard this mindset of purity? Number one, we need to save sex for marriage. A lot of you in this room are already married, but some of you are not. Some of you are approaching dating. Some of you are single. You're thinking about dating. You want to later. We need to say no, I am, we need to recognize, this is the thing, you need to recognize the specialness, the uniqueness of the relationship, that it is beautiful, it is wonderful, it's intended for just you too, and say, I want that, I want that, I need that, and so you say, I'm going to wait for it, I'm not going to sneak up to the table. Right now, if you're not married, you're sitting at the table alone. It's that the seat is reserved for your future wife and your future husband. You don't invite people in to sit at the table for a meal and then leave. And then another person sit at the table and then leave. It is a spot that is reserved for your one and only, and you never bring anyone else to the table. And when you accomplish that, it is so special. I can attest to it. It's so special to have saved it for somebody else. Now, I recognize none of us is perfect. Like, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I get that. But it's important, though, even if you, have, even if you are married and you, and you didn't save yourself from marriage, whatever your situation is, it's still important to adopt this mindset. Why? For your kids. For your kids and for other people that you're sharing it with. So that they can live their best life. So that they can enjoy it. And also, we can move, we can like move forward. You can move forward from, from us. So many, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a culture where we're, like, I, I've heard so many young Christians say, like, I know that, like, the pastor said not to have sex before marriage, but, like, no one does that anymore. Like, that's, he's just, like, saying that for the kids, you know? Like, we're just saying that because we have to say, no, it's true. 
Like people, we're actually doing it. The church is actually doing it. We're actually saving ourselves for marriage. Young people, we're actually saving ourselves for marriage. You can do it too. It's a wonderful thing. And as I said before, this is the point I'm driving home at. If, if, you, have, if you have failed, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if, if you or your husband or you and your wife were, were not, did not save each other for, mar- for each other for marriage, you had sex outside of marriage, you can still approach this approach your marriage through this lens and say, listen, I, God gave me a do-over, so let's do it over. Let's just keep moving forward. I'm going to keep being a place, like, regardless of my past, like, the past is gone. The old is gone. The, the new has come. Let's leave the past in the gutter where it belongs and pursue an attitude of purity with our spouse, even right now right? That means continuing. I I may have not been that place of refreshment in the past. I'm going to be that place of refreshment today. I'm going to be that place of refreshment for her, for him later. I may have not reserved myself for my my spouse in the past, but I'm sure as heck going to reserve it for them now. And God sees that. There is something amazing about people Young men, young women, old men, old women who have not lived their life right before with God and saying, I'm going to have a paradigm shift. I am going to turn my life around. I'm going to start living for Jesus now. And you know what Jesus says? You are my son. You are my daughter. You are pure. You are undefiled. We are the bride of Christ Christ has taken us under his wing. We are all sinners. We are all filthy, covered in sin. We've all got different stuff. But God has looked at us and says, you are beautiful. You are unique. You are wonderful. You are undefiled through the blood of Christ. I'm going to take you as my wife. The God of the universe who defines perfection, looks at you, looks at you, looks at all of you and all of your flaws and says, I love you so much that I'm going to forgive all of your sins and I'm going to bring you in to be my wife. It's beautiful. Forgiveness and reconciliation and walking this path of purity that says, yeah, I screwed up in the past. Who freaking cares? I'm moving forward. I shouldn't have said that. I'm moving forward. (laughs) I'm moving forward. And I'm living my life in purity now because God has called me to. And because that's what my wife needs. That's what my husband needs. I want to be pure for them. I want to be that place of refreshment for them. So we save sex for marriage before and in the midst of marriage. We say, this is something that's only between me and you. Let's save it. Number two, we set strong boundaries. I was talking about work wives and work husbands. That's not good. <laughs> um, there's a special relationship and there's a, there's a special secret level of intimacy that you only share with your spouse. You just don't cross those, you don't cross those, those, those boundaries with somebody else. You don't start, there's no such thing as harmless flirting with someone out in the world. We treat each other with, you know, we shouldn't be like, I can't talk to you, you you know, you're a woman, you know. I can't talk to you, you're a man. That's what other religions do, but not us. We're called to be brothers and sisters. So we approach each other through an attitude of respect and honoring, but we don't cross the line into, hey, you're looking pretty good today. Hey, wow, is that a new dress? Those new cufflinks? I don't know. (laughs) We set boundaries for ourselves, and we decide. This can be a conversation between you and your spouse. What are the boundaries? What are the boundaries for our relationship with with people of the opposite sex? And then you stick to those. Um, What some people have done is like, I mean, what we do in our office, we're, we're pastors, we're Christians. Like, like it, we should not be, like, we're trying our best, people, right? 
But we have set boundaries in our office where there is never, at the church, there is never a man and a woman alone at the church at the same time. That is a boundary. And let me tell you, it is so inconvenient, people. It's so inconvenient. Because it'll, it, it'll be me and Pastor Shelley at the church, and it's like, okay, I guess I gotta go to the library. But you know, it's worth it. It is worth it, and it is valuable, because we are, nothing's gonna happen. But we protect ourselves, we protect ourselves, and we also protect our spouses. We're thinking of them, and we're honoring them, and we're saying, we're not gonna let the devil sneak in. And we're not gonna let the devil accuse us of something that's not real. So many times I've heard of the devil coming in and accusing people of, of things that aren't even true, but people believe them. So we don't open a door for the devil. We set boundaries. And number three, we are proactive against pornography. It is insidious. It is everywhere. We need to guard against it. It is not enough to just look, to just say like, okay, well, I'm not going to sin today. I'm just going to like, I'm just going to like, what's the word? Like force of will it. Just, let, just like, it's, that's not good enough. It's everywhere. It's in your pocket. You need to set up boundaries. You need to set up blockers for yourself. Like I have blockers on everything, every single device that I own because I don't want to sin. I don't want to fall into that path. And so even if I'm not having a problem with it, I'm saying I might later. So I'm going to set it up on my phone. I'm going to set it up on my computer. My wife is my accountability partner because I want to be reserved for her. I don't want to bring anyone else to the table. So we need to be proactive. Let me tell you something. There is a, a lie of the devil that says that we need to hide our sins from one another. That says, you know, and we go to church, we need to pretend to be perfect, pretend like we've got it all together because that's what the church is supposed to be, right? No, that's not true. We need to come to each other and confess our sins and help each other. That's the purpose of the church. We're helping each other be better at all times. So I'm going to tell you right now, I will never, and Pastor Garen and Pastor Shelley, none of us will ever feel any derision towards you. We will never shame you. We will never make you feel bad if you came to us and said, I'm struggling with pornography. Never. You're a hero. You are a hero because you had the strength and the courage to come to us so we can, to get help. That's heroic. That's wonderful. That's what the church needs to be doing. Can confess your sins to one another and you can find healing, restoration, renewing of your mind. So our church has... Um, We've been doing this for a couple of years now. We started an accountable to you group. And essentially, it's a software you can, you can install on your phone, on your devices, and you set up accountability partners. So if anything questionable comes up in your searches or whatever, it will alert your accountability partner and let them know. And it can be one of us. It can be your spouse. I would recommend it be your spouse because that puts the fear of God in you. Just saying. Um... It could be you, it could be your spouse, it could be anybody. And then it just helps. Because what you're doing is you're cutting the legs off of sin. The devil is, prowling, is prowling around like a roaring lion trying to get you to sin. Lust has legs. You've got to cut them off. Cut them off. And you will find freedom in that. Sound good? So... If you are interested in this in this software, would you just give us an e shoot us an email? We will help you get it set up on your devices. Um, you can email if you're if you're a man, you can email me or Pastor Garen. If you're a woman, please email Pastor Shelley. And we just love to help you. We'd love to help you get through that. That's how we guard the mindset of purity. To be pure means to be reserved for one person. That's so special. I'm reserved for Sarah. She's reserved for me. I know things about Sarah that none of you know. She knows things about me that none of you know. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I know things about her like the good for about her, the good, the bad, and the uniquely beautiful. <laughs> we know things about each other. It's amazing. We're reserved for one another. 
It's a special relationship that I'm glad to only share with her, and that's what God wants for you. He wants for every single one of you to have something special, for husbands and wives to have this deep, open, honest relationship of trust and physical intimacy that's yours and yours alone. I am yours, you are mine. No one comes between us. Amen? Amen. God wants the best for you. He wants you to be refreshed by one another. He wants you to find someone who will refresh you if you are single. To be filled to overflow through the love of your spouse to say she or he is more than enough. 35 gallons a minute of the freshest, coolest, purest water I have ever tasted. It's all mine. Refreshed and reserved. Would you all stand to your feet, please? And there are a couple of different things that I want to pray for. So, How many of you, after hearing this message, you would say, I want to adopt this mindset of purity. Like maybe I've been struggling with being a place of refreshment for my spouse. Or maybe you've been struggling with like keeping yourself reserved for your spouse, whether you're in marriage or outside of marriage. So let's, let's do the first one first. How many of you want to be a better at being a place, of, a place of refreshment for your spouse, better at caring for them? I'm raising my hand. I want to be a better, I want to be a better well, a better place of refreshment. Okay, let me pray for you. Jesus, we want to refresh our spouses. And we want to be people, if we are single in the future, who will refresh our spouses. And so, Lord, I ask that you will help us. I, I ask that you, you will take any selfishness out of our heart. We just throw it out in Jesus' name. And we just say, it's not about us. It's about being there for our spouse. It's about caring for them and lifting them up, making them the best they can be. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to find ways that we can be that place of refreshment for them. In Jesus' name, amen. And with everyone still standing, but with everyone's eyes still closed, everyone's eyes closed, please. I just have a question. And, and if, you, if you have struggled with pornography, with, with sex, and you feel like you have, uh, have had a sinful relationship with it in the past, or you're dealing with it now, and you just want to ask for forgiveness, would you just make eye contact with me? Just make eye contact with me. Okay, yep. Okay. Let's, let's all pray together. Dear Jesus, you are so good. Let, I, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't mean for, ever, for the, only the people. I, let's, have, let's have everybody pray together, like everyone. So dear Jesus, <laughs> you are so good. You forgave me of my sins. And I accept that forgiveness. I've made, I may have made mistakes in the past, but you have forgiven me. And so I look to the future and pursue a mindset of purity. Help me, God, to stay pure and to walk in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. And I think we can all safely pay, pray that prayer. Amen? Awesome. And then I have one more prayer, and this is for all of the single people who maybe you're looking for a spouse, or maybe you've become discouraged in your, in your seeking of a spouse. You want to be married. You feel like God is calling you to be married, but it's just been a hard road, and you have not yet made it there. I just want to remind you of that well. 100 200, 300, and at 350 feet, that was where the water was. 
So I am just believing, and I believe God put it on my heart to tell you that if you are single and you are looking to be married, there is someone for you. There is someone who will be a place of refreshment for you, and there is someone with whom you can live in just a reserved love with. And I just want to pray for you, just me. I'll pray, I'll pray for you. Dear Jesus, I pray for all the singles in here who are looking to be married. And Lord, I pray that you will bring someone into their life, a Christian who loves you and who will be just a wonderful wife, a wonderful husband to them. Lord, I believe you, are, you have been preparing them for these people. And I pray that you will just make them known. Bless them, Jesus. Give them patience while they wait, but encouragement knowing that blessing is coming. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I always want, this is a lot of prayer, but it's prayer is good. We always pray. <laughs> I also, want, I always want to extend the opportunity at the end of our messages. If you feel led to follow Jesus, you say, I want to follow Jesus to become his bride. With every eye closed, would you just say, I want to follow Jesus. Raise your hand if you want to, if you want to become a Christian in the room or online. Okay, looks like we're all good. So just for the people online, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I love you. Please forgive me of my sins. I turn to you and ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior, and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Awesome. Well, guys, you made it. You made it through the uncomfortable topic. We love you, and God loves you, and he has such good things in store for you. Amen? All right. God bless. Christian, great job bringing God's word and setting a standard for us. And I, th I think that's, it's a beautiful and clear standard. So praise God for that. I just want to clarify uh, that if you would like to be part of the Accountable to You group, you would choose your own accountability partner. It does not have to be one of us. It could be one of us. We are willing. But you would choose your own. But if you want to be a part uh, of our group so you can get in there for that group rate and everything, uh, all you do is go to our website. You, you could talk to one of us if you want. But go to, go to our website. Click on About. The, you know, go to the menu for our church. About. Look at the team page. And on the team page is everybody's email. All right, so you, you can just contact the pastor uh, directly that you would like to, and then we'll, we'll get you set up. We'll get you added to the group, all right? Uh, so I'm um, so, so glad we've been together today. This is a good, it's been a good day, and I, I, I hope that lots to think about uh, this week as we go. Um, if you put your faith in Jesus today, we have an online course for you. And if you would head to the, the Following Jesus table in the lobby, we've got a gift bag for you, a swag bag that will get you started with the, with the book for the class and everything. All right? So we have that for you. A worship team, if you're interested in singing or playing and being a worship leader at, at our, our church, if you're interested in being on the worship team, come see Pastor Shelley right up front right now. God bless you. See you next week, everybody.